This week, we're talking about two former chief judges of the state of New York. First, we're going to talk about Chief Judge Judith Kay. She was the first female chief judge in the history of New York State. And she was the longest serving chief judge of New York State. So that means she was the top judge in all of New York State at the state level. And the only people who could overturn her court, the court over which she presided, is the U.S. Supreme Court in general. And sometimes the court called the Second Circuit could overturn her court, but not directly, but they could overturn certain rulings, etc., through something called collateral action. Uh, but in general, only the U.S. Supreme Court could overturn her court, and she had the administrative power. And one of her greatest legacies was the appointment of her successor, the um, sort of the grooming of her successor, and we have said quite a bit about Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman, her successor, who, quite frankly, I was very skeptical of as he was sort of ushered through the ranks. And of course, as you, if you've been following the show, you know that my concerns did not come to fruition, and in fact, he did something I could only hope for, well, he did several things I could only hope for, which was to administratively take on some of the injustices uh, in the court system, and his legacy will be amazing. And that brings us to the second point. The second chief, former chief judge we're talking about is Chief Judge Lippman. That's right. As of December 31st, he has stepped down as the chief judge. He has been forced to retire, and we're going to talk about this event December 31st, 2015. So starting 2016, we do not have a presiding chief judge at the moment. Moreover, it looks like the judiciary will be brought back into its goose-stepping fashion. Hopefully it won't. Hopefully whoever succeeds Chief Judge Lippman will go further. But Governor Cuomo's first pick and first appointment is a prosecutor, which you know I'll go into in greater detail uh, on another show. But not that there's a problem with the individual, but the class prosecutor means that they do nothing but work for Big Brother. And if you do nothing but work for Big Brother, and your job is to be separate and independent from Big Brother, there's a problem. And, you know, Judge Lippman was fantastic in how he addressed procedurally some of the injustices. And as I stated, you know, he was groomed. He stood on the shoulders of Chief Judge K. Chief Judge K was the chief judge and stepped down uh, seven years ago, and she died at age 77. And he, Judge Lippman has stepped down. It just seems so short, and it seems his reign was so short. And we wish he had as much time as Chief Judge K had before him. Chief Judge K was appointed by Governor Mario Cuomo in 1983. That's our current governor's dad appointed her. This is the, the, the Cuomo legacy, and this is one of the positive ones, uh, was that Governor Andrew Cuomo's father appointed the longest-serving chief judge in the history of New York State and the first female chief judge. And she did a marvelous job as chief judge, only eclipsed by her hand-picked, groomed successor, Chief Judge Lippman, who took it even further. And, of course, he was able to do that 
uh, when he flowed into office and he used his uh, knowledge because he wasn't a, a judge of the line so to speak he was the administrative judge who saw a lot of problems administratively that people were having and a lot of abuses administratively that people were suffering from and he did a great job so Chief Judge K passed away on January 7th it's just happened right after her successor stepped down from the chief judgeship he didn't actually step down he was forced to retire based on a constitutional provision regarding the judges ages here in New York State judges are forced out at age 70 meanwhile in federal court they stay on for life which is something that I have approved of I think that the life term appointments are good but I think they need to have some sort of ability assessment because uh, some of the federal judges are definitely loopy they don't follow the law they've lost their minds um, meanwhile people who in their 70s which is relatively young a 70 year old in today's world a sound mind and body and who have to be reassessed every 15 years through the electoral process uh, you know they're being forced out and you, you have these drooling idiot federal judges uh, running around now mind you you've got some brilliant federal judges and you've got federal judges uh, such as the great chief judge Duberstein who served into his 90s uh, and he wasn't a lifetime appointment. Uh, uh, one of the life to Article Three federal judges with a lifetime appointment, who I hold in high esteem, is Judge Jack Weinstein. Judge Weinstein was, in fact, the chief judge of the Brooklyn Federal Court when I first encountered him. And that, of course, was years ago. And he, of course, was an intellectual powerhouse back in the day and currently and continues to be. That's one of the differences is, you know, back in the old days, the federal judges used to use their brains and therefore they would retain their intellectual skills. Nowadays, it seems like some of the judges uh, didn't have many skills to begin with and therefore they don't have much to lose. And. You know, it's readily apparent. But I digress. So the interesting thing here is that Chief Judge Kay's legacy uh, continued through from one Cuomo all the way to the other. And father and son, you know, she was there to see the son succeed the governor that actually appointed her. If only the new governor Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo, would try to appoint someone as spectacular as Chief Judge K, and, or, you know, really shoot for the stars and try to go for someone as spectacular as, as Chief Judge Lippman, who has had a dramatic effect on the judiciary and the courts and the day to day operation of the courts and how the courts affect people and how he's turned down some of the trauma so this was supposed to be an episode just about Chief Judge Lippman Chief Judge K passed away as this episode was being written so it wouldn't make sense not to mention her passing particularly when uh, addressing her impact and her her biggest impact was in getting Governor Spitzer to appoint her hand-picked successor and that was something I was kind of worried about she had governor she had governor Spitzer appoint him to the appellate division here in Manhattan and then governor Patterson appointed him to the chief judgeship so this was an amazing job and you know this was a once-in-a-lifetime uh, opportunity to pick a successor who could push the limits and really challenge the profession and the judiciary to do more and to do better.
So Chief Judge Littman was unsuccessful in extending the number of years before automatic retirement kicked in. You know, it was it was one of the battles that he was not able to win. And it's a pity that he wasn't able to win that because we would have had him for another decade. And who knows what what wonderful things he would have done with those extra 10 years. But these two jurists, former jurists, have done amazing things for New York State. And, you know, Judge Lippman, just Chief Judge Lippman coming right out of the hot seat where on his last days he did a reform where there is a uniform standard of ethics and rules of ethics and uniform procedure of ethics throughout the whole state. This is mind-boggling, Pre you know, uh, precedent-setting, uh, record-breaking, unreal, uh, that, you know, this is, this is his, his encore. He's, he's stepping down and boom, on his way out the door, he, he, he does a, you know, if it was ice skating, he does a octuple lutz, <laughs> something like, wow, what a way to go out. Amazing and wonderful to see. And, you know, one of the big things I was concerned about him was I was concerned about ethics because as the chief administrative judge, you know, I had raised some issues to tour, to his office regarding ethics. I'd gone down physically to the OCA office and brought up some of the issues with some of these crappy judges, you know, and unethical judges, and uh, or at least it was one or two, and I had done a... Uh, even something a little more dramatic, probably, uh, I'm not even sure, I have to go look it up, uh, probably something like some order to show cause, and I served it on his office. And I was like, wow, you know, he's not doing anything. Well, one of the things he did as chief judge was shine a light on the defective disciplinary process. And that was wonderful. You know, I talked about it this summer. And clearly, he had no power to do anything uh, when I was fussing and saying, ah, he's not doing anything about ethics. The only time he got the, the direct power to do anything about ethics was when he was the presiding judge of the first department here in Manhattan, or rather there in Manhattan if you're in Brooklyn. And he did good. This is one of the cleanest subdivisions of ethics. It doesn't make them perfect. And, of course, there are other problems. There will always be problems. And one of the big problems is, is the attorneys think of themselves as being somehow greater than normal humans. Um, and that's a problem. But other than that, you know, it runs relatively smoothly. It's kind of interesting. They're very aggressive, sometimes maybe even a little too aggressive, but that's certainly better than the alternative where they encourage uh, outright crime by attorneys. So, Chief Judge Lippman wrote on his, I mean, this is his last state of the judiciary report. He wrote, access to justice means that everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, or orientation, irrespective of wealth or poverty, whether we are mighty or weak, each and every one of us gets his or her day in court. And, you know, with a lot of these guys, it's just like, you know, they're blowing smoke up your butt. This guy actually put things, policies in place that brought this to life in, in many ways. I mean, not, it's still not perfect. There's work in progress. There are issues and problems, of course, of course. Rome wasn't built in a day. And, you know, it's not like there, there aren't uh, barbarians at the gate tearing down the walls while you're trying to build Rome. So, no matter how you slice it, if you walk into courts especially you go down to civil court and see the difference there's there's a helpful area you know and there's some people oh you know the court attorneys aren't 
aren't telling me exactly what to do, blah, blah, blah. But there's information there. How can I procedurally address this? They, the, the state court has exceeded the federal court, which is saying something. I mean, at, at one point, the Southern District of New York, I called those the, the wonder clerks, the super clerks. They were, those pro se clerks were something. I would say the state court has exceeded that. And it's not, the, and they do it while, while not overstepping the limits. But then the policy side, hey, you're trying to walk into court and accuse someone of owing a debt, and you do it with no paperwork. That was the norm. They, they would freeze your account. They didn't have crap. They had nothing. It's just some lawyer says so. And then it turns out that they're wrong. They just go, oh, my bad. But they, they've caused you all sorts of problems and, and money and cash and, and, and stress and lost days of work, which is more money, uh, more cash and bank fees. That's not the common situation now. I, I barely hear what I used to hear a decade ago was oh my bank account's been frozen and now well I was never served with any papers well a lot of that has, it, it's not over maybe you know I'm sure there are other people still suffering some of this but the the wave of it is is over the flood the tidal wave the tsunami of crap Generally speaking, you know, he's he, he set up the access, the uh, task force regarding access to justice, and now he's converted that into a permanent commission. Make sure it's fair. It's like permanent. That's there. This is what he leaves us with. He's sent money towards increasing civil legal services. He set up scholarship programs for, for law students who are going to work with the poor. Procedures to keep people in homes during foreclosure proceedings and to protect consumers from unscrupulous debt collectors. That's the big one I've, I've seen. It just, you know, shockwaves. And he's trying to open up the court system to review. And he's trying to help reach, have the court reach out to communities and say, hey, we're here for you, rather than closing the door and saying, only if you're white and in a suit. Or just plain white. So he's he's really done quite a bit. And also, for white people who aren't rich, he's done stuff too. It's not just a, a race thing. It's just all around the unfairness in the system. And he's addressing, well, he addressed a, a great deal of it. And it's too bad he didn't have time to do more. So he didn't succeed in getting the retirement age raised to 80, but he did succeed in getting it on the ballot, and the voters rejected it. You know, for whatever reasons, there, there needs to be a campaign to explain. This week, we're talking about two former chief judges of the state of New York. First, we're going to talk about Chief Judge Judith Kay. She was the first female chief judge in the history of New York State, and she was the longest serving chief judge of New York State. So that means she was the top judge in all of New York State at the state level, and the only people who could overturn her court, the court over which she presided, is the U.S. Supreme Court in general, and sometimes the court called the Second Circuit could overturn her court, but not directly, but they could overturn certain rulings, etc., through something called collateral action. Uh, but in general, only the U.S. Supreme Court could overturn her court, and she had the administrative power. And one of her greatest legacies was the appointment of her successor, the um, sort of the grooming of her successor. And we have said quite a bit about Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman, her successor, 
quite frankly, I was very skeptical of as he was sort of ushered through the ranks. And of course, as you, if you've been following the show, you know that my concerns did not come to fruition. And in fact, he did something I could only hope for. He did several things I could only hope for, which was to administratively take on some of the injustices uh, in the court system, and his legacy will be amazing. And that brings us to the second point. The second chief, former chief judge we're talking about is Chief Judge Lippman. That's right. As of December 31st, he has stepped down as the chief judge. He has been forced to retire, and we're going to talk about this event December 31st, 2015. So starting 2016, we do not have a presiding chief judge at the moment. Moreover, it looks like the judiciary will be brought back into its goose-stepping fashion. Hopefully it won't. Hopefully whoever succeeds Chief Judge Littman will go further. But Governor Cuomo's first pick and first appointment is a prosecutor, which you know I'll go into in greater detail uh, on another show. But not that there's a problem with the individual, but the class prosecutor means that they do nothing but work for Big Brother. And if you do nothing but work for Big Brother, and your job is to be separate and independent from Big Brother, there's a problem. And you know, Judge Lippman was fantastic in how he addressed procedurally some of the injustices. And as I stated, you know, he was groomed. He stood on the shoulders of Chief Judge K. Chief Judge K was the chief judge and stepped down uh, uh, seven years ago. And she died at age 77. And Judge Lippman has stepped down. It just seems so short, and it seems his reign was so short. And we wish he had as much time as Chief Judge K had before him. There was other activity, a, a, a committee of the New York City Bar in 2013 put forth some of these proposals, and it's uh, the chief judge is, is running with these proposals. Now, this is very fascinating, because in that May, May uh, 2013 article, uh, Chief Judge Lippman says, and I quote, it's not unusual to find non-lawyers who are more expert than lawyers in a particular area, unquote. Uh, the then lawyers was in brackets that's letting you know what the context was. Now, we've discussed that. In this uh, show, in Rent Wars, you've seen clients of, of something called CMH Services. Now, that's a non-lawyer operation that represents... Uh, unemployed people, and you may recognize a voice or two there. Now, what we haven't highlighted anywhere is that CMH services is undefeated. Now, there are caveats, and there's an asterisk, and undefeated, you know, doesn't include people who didn't want to follow their appeal, people who didn't show up, uh, people who wouldn't cooperate, and basically, even if you take away the asterisk, uh, you would have 97%, even including people who don't show up. Uh, 97% uh, win rate. That's much higher than any lawyer uh, who, who does that. There are also what are called impossible cases, which are cases where someone definitely wasn't supposed to get their unemployment insurance. Nonetheless, you still win because the stars aligned in a certain way. And those an, an example of an impossible case is a claimant who signed a statement saying that he threatened to punch his boss in the mouth. Well, you know, that's that's pretty much uh, uh, unemployment. You, usually you will not get unemployment if you do that, and uh, CMH was able to, to get that. So the fact that, that Lippman 
not only just said, yes, there are non-lawyer reps who are competent, but he said some of them are even better. Well, that hits close to home because he even stated unemployment directly, and there really aren't that many uh, non-lawyers representing people in the unemployment area, so that really hit close to home, and I'd like to thank Judge Lippman for that observation. What's happening is, is that not only are some non-lawyers good, there's some non-lawyers who aren't good, but there are some non-lawyers who are very good that Judge Lippman is recognizing. But I think also uh, he understands that there are some lawyers who are crap, total, absolute crap. That's, that's always been true. That's true in any profession. But in the legal profession, there's this pretense that lawyers are the gold standard. They're always wonderful. Uh, our friend Emil Tanasia, who appears on the show, and we're going to have him back soon, he likes to say, well, you know, the bar exam is a minimum competency exam. That means basically it doesn't mean you have to be the best to pass it. It's just if you reach a certain level, uh, you can pass this thing. You never have to take it again. You don't really have to ever be tested on your knowledge again. And boom, you can be a lawyer. Basically, what you're being tested on is how much money you have. So, uh, meaning that for the law school, for the bar prep tests, um, for everything. So what Chief Judge Lippman is doing here is amazing because he's saying you have to provide services. Now, the legal profession has been an unfit monopoly. It's a monopoly that refuses to provide the service. Imagine if Con Ed said, we're only going to provide power to Park Avenue. We're only going to give power to certain rich condos. And the rest of you people, um, you can't have power. And we said, well, screw you. We'll, we'll get some power from Lilco or some power from PSE&G uh, since you don't want to provide it. And Con Ed says, oh, no, 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 no. The only company that can provide electricity in New York City is Con Ed. And we're not going to provide you with electricity. Uh, you, you'd have to pay a million dollars to get some electricity. But we're going to prevent you from getting electricity from any of our competitors. That is the state of affairs in the legal profession. And here we have the head the head, the top dog of New York's legal profession, the chief judge of New York, saying we have to provide the services. And if we're not going to do it, we're going to get other people to do it. And we're going to get students to do it. And we're going to make sure this need is met. Bravo to Chief Judge Lippman. This is simply incredible.